Well, our scripture reading today comes from 1 Kings, but before we hear it, let me give you some background. In the ancient Near East, in Old Testament times, each region had its own god, and the people argued as to whose god was the most powerful. Now, Baal was the storm god, the god who brought rain, and because we can't live without water, Baal was thought of as the god of life. Whenever it rains, Baal is alive and death is defeated. When there's a drought, Baal is dead and death is victorious. For the Jewish people, the Israelites, the Lord God of Israel was the one and only true God and was the God of life, not Baal. So our passage today starts just after a passage that tells us that Ahab has become king of Israel and he's married to Jezebel who worships Baal. King Ahab has built an altar and a temple to Baal, provoking the anger of the God of Israel. So onto the scene comes the prophet Elijah, and he tells King Ahab there's going to be no more rain until the God of Israel says so. In other words, Elijah challenges King Ahab and says it's the Lord God of Israel who brings life, not the God of Baal. And so the drought begins. Elijah is sent eastward to a camp by a brook near the River Jordan to be fed by ravens who would bring him bread and meat. And we're supposed to understand that Elijah clearly has food because it's the Lord who has commanded the ravens to feed him. It's the Lord God of Israel who brings life. Well, then the brook supplied by water from Baal finally dries up. And so listen now to the scripture as the Lord's word comes again to Elijah and life comes to him this time from another surprising source. The Lord's word came to Elijah, Get up and go to Zarephath near Sidon and stay there. I have ordered a widow there to take care of you. Elijah left and went to Zarephath. As he came to the town gate, he saw a widow collecting sticks. He called out to her, Please get a little water from me in this cup so I can drink. She went to get some water, and he then said to her, Please, get me a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any food, only a handful of flour in a jar and a bit of oil in a bottle. Look at me. I'm collecting two sticks so that I can make some food for myself and my son. we we'll eat the last of the food and then die. Elijah said to her, Don't be afraid. Go and do what you said. Only make a little loaf of bread for me first. Then bring it to me. You can make something for yourself and your son after that. This is what Israel's God, the Lord, says. The jar of flour won't decrease, and the bottle of oil won't run out until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. The widow went and did what Elijah said. So the widow, Elijah, and the widow's household ate for many days. The jar of flour didn't decrease, nor did the bottle of oil run out, just as the Lord spoke through Elijah. So let us pray together. By the power of your Holy Spirit, startle us with your word, O God, and awaken us to your truth. For Jesus' sake. Well, in our modern world, we might not believe in storm gods and battles between gods, yet we still find it hard to believe that it's the Lord, our God, who brings us abundant life. We push God out. We pin our hopes on other things, whether it's money, materialism, imperialism, capitalism, socialism, political parties, Presidents, corporations, individuals, science, man-made inventions, and so on. There are plenty of males in our world who claim to bring life. So what lessons can we learn from Elijah and the widow about who and what brings abundant life? Elijah learned that God faithfully provides for our needs in unexpected ways. Who would have thought that God's agent would be a poor widow 
with only enough flour and oil for one last meal. And on top of that, she was a Baal worshipper. God uses others to help us, but not those whom we comfortably expect to help us. God breaks down the boundaries we've drawn. God can use Christians, but it's just as likely to use a Muslim, a Mormon, or an atheist. God can use those who dress like us, but God's also quite happy to use a biker dressed in leather and covered in tattoos, or a homeless person who hasn't bathed in the last few days. God can use those who talk like us, but is also likely to use someone who speaks only Spanish, or Korean, or Tagalog. The widow chosen by God didn't have sufficient resources for herself, let alone for Elijah. Both Elijah and the widow had to depend upon the word of the Lord. It was God's word that came to Elijah, but the word had power beyond influencing the prophet. Elijah participated in a mystery. God's word is powerful and we don't always understand it, yet we can experience its unfolding mysteries. Elijah said two important things to the widow. He told her to not be afraid, and he gave her words of hope to cling to as he told her that the flour and the oil would not run out. And we too are called to tell others not to fear and to offer words of hope. So what can we learn from the widow? Well, Reverend Stephen Hayner wrote these words. When Elijah encountered the poor widow, a single mum with problems of her own, he asked her for a cup of water and a small loaf of bread. It turned out the widow was collecting sticks to light a fire so she could bake a little loaf out of the last bit of flour and oil that she had, fully expecting that after this, she and her son would starve to death. Nevertheless, at the word of Elijah, she was willing to provide hospitality one more time. This ordinary, humble woman couldn't have imagined what her quiet act of hospitality would ultimately accomplish, nor that we would be reading her story some 3,000 years later. History turns on some very small hinges. Every day as Elijah and the widow and her son ate their little loaves of bread, they were reminded that God could be trusted for another day. And every day their faith grew. The lessons of trust may look small, but so much may ride on learning these lessons. The ripples move out from the tiny pebble of faith cast into the water of history. Well, one small step makes a difference, and I couldn't resist this cute picture. <laughs> From the widow's perspective, she could not foresee the outcome. She was being asked to give away the last of her stocks of food. She demonstrated radical hospitality and extravagant generosity in helping Elijah. She couldn't see how things would turn out. She did what felt right at the time. She demonstrated love and compassion. The widow took one small step. And sometimes that's all we can do, just one step. When problems seem insurmountable, one small step can make all the difference. When we're willing to trust God, the smallest, most ordinary action can produce the most life-changing and history-changing results. For a farmer to harvest a great crop in the fall, Seeds have to be sown in the spring. Even then, the seeds might not germinate, there might not be enough water for them to grow, weeds can come and choke out the tender plants, disease can destroy the plants, the wind can blow them over, the sun might not shine enough for the plants to ripen. Yet the farmer holds on to the hope that through the days and the seasons that there will be a sufficient crop 
that there'll be enough when the harvest time comes to pick and store and sell. Enough to see them through to the next planting and on to the next harvest. And it all begins with faithfully sowing those small seeds and trusting in the mystery. For us to hold on to the hope of an abundant harvest in a world that seems full of despair, we have to trust God by sowing some seeds or taking those first small steps. Trinity United Methodist Church in Prince Frederick, Maryland, has a ministry with a special group of hurting, fearful people who are in real need of a world word of hope. We're going to watch a small video clip of the steps that Trinity UMC are taking to erase fear and offer hope. And there's one professional in this story, maybe a little bit like Elijah, and the others who are helping, maybe like the widow in our scripture, offering hope by drawing on their own experiences and resources. So have a look at this. I deployed to Afghanistan a total of six times. We did patrols in Fallujah. We did patrols in Ramadi. There was probably about 20 of us that are real close, and in that group, uh, two, two people had committed suicide, and they just couldn't deal with what they came home and had to you know, fight with. Coming back home was very difficult. The insomnia, the, the night terrors. In a moment when I would feel happy, I would sort of stop myself. You know, oh yeah, and be like, you failed, you failed big time and allowing these people to die, you know, maybe you shouldn't allow yourself to feel happy in this moment. The sights, the smells, the fears, the guilt over the buddies that didn't come home. Those are things that are best talked about with other vets. You know, we need some more. We ought to have at least... I'm Dr. Al Brewster, one of the founders of Southern Maryland Battle Buddies. I'm a member here at Trinity United Methodist Church and a licensed clinical social worker. I've been interested in post-traumatic stress disorder since my days in Vietnam. Disabled American veterans at DAV. We have seven trained battle buddies. I'm not training people to be counselors, but I am training them to encourage, to walk the walk, to help get people to appointments if they need to. Veterans at the library. I'm working with another female veteran. Her counselor referred her to Battle Buddies, and that's how we got connected. I'm Ariana Day, and I'm a volunteer. I myself personally have come from three generations of family who've served in the military. This is the closest way for me to serve the country in, in following in my father's footsteps. This is my mansion, my home. My name is Robert Jenkins. I'm a Vietnam veteran. I'm a Purple Heart veteran. Just before I got here, I was in a homeless shelter. Property insurance. In Gil case. and battle buddies. And they helped me get my place of my home. You do have a counselor there, right? Yes, I do. Robert and I serve I in Vietnam together. You develop friendships in, in combat that are really, really close. We, are, we depend on each other to keep us al each other alive. We want to have a program that is vet to vet because we understand each other, because we know each other's needs. We have the drop-in center here at Trinity, anywhere from 13 to 30 percent of our veterans coming back are going to have PTSD. The Veterans Administration has hospitals throughout the country, usually in urban areas, yet the fact is that over 40 percent of military people come from small rural demographics. How are you? This is one way that we can be salt and light and really extend the ministry of the church out into the wider community in very practical ways. We're trying to gear up for what we know is coming as these wars wind down. These guys and gals that are coming home, they need to know that, hey, other people have been there, done that, and somehow managed to be okay and you can be happy. <laughs> this video was brought to you by the people of the United Methodist Church through world service donations. A journey 
of a thousand miles begins with a single step. And we give thanks for the ministry of our sister church at Trinity United Methodist Church. Trust grows with the small steps of faith of all of us ordinary people. Small steps towards Jesus rather than away from him. Small steps of faithful obedience when we're attentive to the opportunities and God's call all around us. There's no act of faithfulness which is too small to be unusable in the hand of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together. O oh Lord our God, we thank you for your faithfulness to us. Help us to put aside the ideas of scarcity and to live into your abundant life. Show us the next step to take and take away our fear as we learn to climb by taking small steps. In Jesus' name we pray.